Uh, this is a comic that you have seen in a slight variation before. Um, so of course we are not there yet, but we showed uh, that maybe it's not so hopeless to recover causal structures from uh, observational data as well. In the in the last part of this um, in this uh, of this uh, mini course, I would like to talk about um, applications to machine learning, and this is a summary of what we have seen so far. The part two. So we have he looked at three ideas just to wrap up the last sessions. So the first one was this independence-based idea where we are establishing a link between conditional independencies and deseparation statements in the graph. And this was done by the faithfulness in the Markov condition. So then the idea was simply to say, okay, we have a joint distribution. We look at all the independence tests, um, independence statements that hold, and then we can relate this to the graph. So this can be done in a clever way. And we have seen that uh, in many cases we can only identify um, a certain non-trivial class of graphs. This was called the Markov equivalence class. The second idea was um, pointing at the structural causal models and saying, let's see what we can do if these structural assignments sort of have an easy form. So here we say that uh, each variable is a function of its parents, right? And uh, usually we have a general function uh, that says it's a function of its parents, comma, some noise. But if you're saying if it has a simple form, uh, in this case, bless you, in this case, additive noise, then it turned out that we can actually uh, also infer the causal structure from the joint distribution. But keep in mind, of course, there's a very strong assumption here. I didn't talk, by the way, about uh, so much about hidden variables. There's also some work here, but many open questions about identifiability. So what can you do if you have some hidden variables? There are a couple of uh, hypotheses, but very few proofs. The last idea that we looked at was this invariant prediction idea. And so there, the, the sort of very roughly, the idea was to say, well, these causal models are uh, very invariant. So whenever we are, um, we are having these models in different uh, settings, then uh, here, for example, you see a model from one of the genes uh, regressed on one of its causes. And what you see is that uh, you can fit the same model like in different environments. And here, these orange points uh, relate to many different sort of interventional distributions. But roughly saying, you can see here that these causal models remain stable over many different environments. And this is actually something that we exploited for causal inference, because we are saying, well, if we have data from different environments, what we can now do is we can just look for these invariant models and then relate them to the causal ones. So this is a. A recap of uh, the last of the second part. Any questions about this? Good. So then we are moving on to the last part. The, this is applications. This may be a bit too much. So these are really ideas for machine learning, uh, how to relate the causal ideas to machine learning. And I will give sort of a couple of ideas. And uh, um, I think I will also not need the full uh, two hours. Uh, so we will have some time for discussion. And maybe you have some further ideas or comments on these things as well. OK. So applications to machine learning. What do I mean by this? So the first idea is a very simple idea uh, that I think is worth noting. So this is related to semi-supervised learning. Are you all familiar with semi-supervised learning? Uh, who is familiar with semi-supervised learning? OK, so a, a couple of. Um, you are not. So a very small recap. I apologize for the others. So what is semi-supervised learning? The idea is to have, so in supervised learning, we are receiving data. And let's say we are in a classification setting. We also receive uh, sort of the class label. So let's say we are given some data points. So this is all, these are always our features. And this is, let's say, something that we want to predict. So why is the class label, let's say? So we are receiving some data points, y1, uh, x1, y1 until x and yn. And this is always the class label. This is always the feature. And let's say they are IID. So this is a usual setting. I mean, you can do classification. You can also do regression, uh, sort of a very similar thing. It's both supervised learning. And supervised uh, sort of means that uh, for each of these features, you get a label. In semi-supervised learning, the problem now is as follows. So imagine. And this is uh, maybe a picture. And this is always the label that says whether there's a line in the picture or not. So this is a very high dimensional feature. And again, now you have, uh, let's say, 1,000 pictures. And for each of these pictures, you know this, they're a line or not. 
In semi-supervised learning, you also assume that you have additional values for x. So you're basically assuming that you have these labeled data and a lot of unlabeled data. Here you are saying, let's say, m additional data points from x that are also IID, but of course then from the marginal distribution. So these are IID from p, xy, and this is IID from px. And the question is now, can we somehow use these unlabeled data points, so for example these additional pictures where we don't know whether there's a line on, in or not, can we use them to improve our prediction uh, in the original problem? This is called semi supervised learning. The name speaks for itself, I guess, because here we, have, uh, here we are supervised, here we are unsupervised. What are sort of common techniques, how to do this? So there are um, different assumptions that uh, lie beyond this uh, um, idea. One of them is the following. So if we now draw some of the space of x, so let's call this the first component and the second component of x, and now the idea is, for example, to say, well, we have maybe some distribution of x. I'm now trying, I'm very bad in this, but trying to draw some density. Let's say, let's say this is one part of the density. And then maybe here we have another high density region that looks like this. So maybe this is the marginal distribution of x. And now one of these, these uh, ideas for semi-supervised learning now say that the decision boundary lies in a low density region of x. Okay, so let's say this is here the density, the decision boundary. So everything that is on this side is plus one, and everything that is on this side is minus one. So all the pictures here contain a line, and all the pictures here do not contain a line. So why would this help us? Why would this be an assumption that is helpful for um, semi supervised learning? Because now imagine you get some data points. So these labeled data points, you always know that here. We have some pictures, and we know they are all plus one, plus one, plus one. And here we have some labels that are all minus one. And now you are somewhat trying to discriminate between them. So if you only have these data points, you say, well, I'm looking for a decision boundary that somewhat goes, it separates these two classes. Now, if you have additional data, and you can think of these being like a large number of data points, then maybe we don't have a label. But then what you get is you get many more data points. They actually let you, um, enable you to get a very good estimation of sort of the density over x. And these are maybe all unlabeled, but what they allow you to do is to get a much better estimate of this um, uh, red decision boundary because of the assumption that says, okay, the decision boundary should lie somewhere in a low density region. So this is, of course, very naive, but this is one of the ideas that uh, underlies semi-supervised learning. So how does this relate now to causal inference? And this is a bit of a fun argument now that I'm uh, trying to do. Um, this is joint work with like uh, Dominic uh, Jansing and Bernard Schulkopf and many others. So here, we have uh, um, the Markov factorization. This is something that I mentioned yesterday. So we said that the uh, distribution is Markov with respect to a graph. If whenever we have a D separation, we also find the corresponding conditional independence in the distribution. Now, this Markov factorization, this is an equivalent sort of assumption that says, OK, a distribution is Markov with respect to a graph if I can write the joint density as the product of these so-called Markov kernels. OK, so this is always the density of a a variable given its parents. So this is the same. So now, <laughs> this is a bit vague maybe, but now there's an assumption that um, uh, is called sometimes modularity or autonomy. And I would like to discuss this in a bit more detail um, in a minute, but this basically says that all these components are independent. And where does this come from? So there's actually some old work um, from Econometrix that is quite nice, I think. So the people, even in the um, 40s, understood quite well what this is supposed to be. So if you look at a causal model, actually a quite an uh, innocent looking assumption that is very crucial to all <laughs> what we are doing in these two days. So if you have a causal model, say a graph, 
Then we looked at interventions, right? So we said, okay, what happens to the system if we intervene on this guy, for example? And the assumption of modularity now says, when you're intervening here, then this is this mute, this most useful tautology ever, you're not intervening anywhere else, right? So you are intervening here, this means you are replacing the structural equation for z, but you're not changing anything else at the same time. So this means the way, for example, how w depend on z and a, this remains exactly the same no matter whether I intervene on z or not. And this is called modularity. Now, if you play with this a bit, so think about a system evolving, for example, over time, and maybe this mechanism changes a bit, and maybe this mechanism changes a bit. But if, for example, this, this modularity holds, then this assumption suggests that these components, they are somewhat independent. And of course, I have to put this in, in parentheses or like in uh, quotation marks, because it's not so clear what does it mean that a con like two conditional distributions here are independent. There are a couple of ways of making this rigorous, but here I'm really looking for the intuition. So somehow it means whenever you know how this structural equation looks like for W, for example, you know the shape of the function or something, or you know the noise distribution, then this doesn't tell you much about the, f the structural equation for Z. So all these components are independent. So to make this very clear, so if you write down the joint distribution here. This is just the first line. So what is this? So now this factorizes p of x times p of y times p of z given x and y times p of a times p of w given a and z. Right? And now sort of this modularity says that for example this is this is this is what I said. So this component here P of z given x and y, this is somewhat independent of this guy. OK, so this is an assumption we are happy to discuss. But this is actually, if you think about it, this really lies at the ground of many of these uh, interventional ideas that we discussed. OK, but if this is true, then this has a, quite an interesting, uh, I think, implication. It goes as follows. So imagine you only have two random variables. You only have one cause and one effect. So this means that then these two things, there's just a special case. So this means that the distribution of the cause is somewhat independent of the conditional distribution of the effect given the cause. Yeah? Kind of uh, getting to the, the uh, uh, statement that you made about the, those two guys being independent, right? So if you look at the first expression, z given x comma y is actually a function of z. The second expression, w given a comma z, is also a function of z. So, so at least at a very high level, if you look at that, there are two functions, both are a function of z, and how, how come they are independent? Yeah, I think more about like the structural equation. Maybe that's then easier to see. So here, this is z is a function of actually x, y, and some noise, right? So, and then for the structural equation for W, looks like this. It's a function g of a comma z and mw. And what it means now is that whenever, so even make it easier and think about additive noise, for example. So this now means as follows, the following. For example, we also have a structural equation for x, right? This is just noise. So this modularity now, this independence means that if you know the distribution of x, this doesn't tell you anything, for example, about the shape of this function. Because this is what comes out of the modularity. I mean, I, I try to motivate it here. I can also just say this is our assumption that these two things are independent. But I'm trying to argue where this comes from. And this is really related, in my point of view, to this modularity, where you're saying, well, for example, if you replace this guy, then this doesn't change. So this is the, what they call modularity, because this is important for interventions, right? Because otherwise, if you intervene somewhere and then the, the full system changes, it would make inference uh, very hard. Yeah. And so what does it mean in uh, sort of the medical domain? We do randomized experiments, right? So we randomize the treatment. And our assumption, and I think we discussed this yesterday, so our assumption is that if we throw the dice, and we have some outcome, and according to the outcome, we give the treatment or not, this does not have any effect so on the sort of way the physical body reacts to the treatment. Right? So here you would have 
treatment causing recovery. And now if you change this guy, if you randomize this guy, this does not change anything about the conditional distribution, how the recovery depends on the treatment. So if you are happy with this, then this has a very direct application for semi-supervised learning. Because what are we doing in semi-supervised learning? So in semi-supervised learning, we are interested exactly in the conditional distribution of y given x. We want to predict y from x. That's the whole point. We want to be able to classify to say, what is the sort of class label for this picture? So is there a line in, the, in this picture or not? So we are interested in p of y given x. But now, in semi-supervised learning, we are trying to improve this prediction by receiving more data from x. So in a way, we are interested in p of y given x, and we try to sort of improve our estimate for p of y given x by introducing like, more, more data from x, which means we have a better, info, like, better knowledge about the marginal distribution of x. Now, if x is the cause and y is the effect, then this principle says it does not work. Because no matter what you know about this p of x, this does not tell you anything about p of y given x. And this is a very, like, a, it's a one-line <laughs> implication. So if this really holds, then you can say semi-supervised learning should not work if you perform it from cause to the effect. This is a very, like, a, it's a one-line implication, but this is sort of a bit of a very strong statement. No? So you would say, aha, so then whenever, so you can talk about really a cause and effect, and you're trying to do semi-supervised learning from the cause to effect, then this sort of uh, contradicts this principle here. So what we did is we tried to see whether this is uh, true in practice or not. And of course, I mean, everything here has to be <laughs> taken so, sort of a bit cautiously. But um, many of the, it turns out that many of the applications, of course, if anything, um, then they, they're usually in the anti-causal direction. So if you think about the picture and the lion, so you have a picture, and then you want to say whether there's a line or not in the picture, then if anything, I guess you would uh, think that the lion should be the cause of the picture or not. Right? So if you take a picture from, the, uh, like from some part in the desert and you put a line in it, then probably the, the picture changes. But if you just change the picture, it's not going to be a lion appearing there. So if anything, I mean, it's a bit difficult to talk about cause and effect here, but if anything, then y is the cause of x and not vice versa. So in these settings, we are not making a statement. We are only saying if x is the effect and y is the, the cause, then semi-supervised learning should not work. Is this clear, what the statement is? OK, so this is what we looked at. I mean, this is, a, um, this is somewhat a meta study. So we didn't now look at, like, we didn't perform semi-supervised learning ourselves. What we did is we ran, this is only one example, we ran through a couple of overview papers, review papers over semi-supervised learning. And we always looked at sort of different data sets. And we checked, does semi-supervised learning really work uh, um, in, in the sense that additional unlabeled data help? Um, or does it not? And what you see here is that we try to classify on the x-axis, you see different data sets, and we try to classify them according to causal or non-causal or un, uh, like anti-causal or confounded or unclear. And it's not a strong statement, but I think it's still a nice result. So what do you see here? These are different, the points are now different sort of semi supervised learning techniques. And what you see is the improvement. So this is the baseline. And you can think of this being the supervised problem. So you're only using the supervised, the labeled data. And then you have a couple of semi-supervised uh, learning techniques. And it turns out that for some of them, actually, you decrease the performance, which is not what you want to do. You want to be above the line to sort of increase the performance. But here, at least, I mean, there are a couple of other experiments as well. But here, I think it's interesting to see that the very few cases that we identified as being causal, those are really the ones where semi-supervised learning does not help. That's the statement uh, we are making. We are not saying that in any other um, setting, semi-supervised learning will work very well. So here you see a couple of cases. Um, these are anti-causal, for example, where semi-supervised learning doesn't work either. We're just saying, well, if you're trying to do it in a causal setting, it's a bit of a risky thing to do. Yeah? Those results, did they, those articles or papers look different in some way? Did it seem careless to apply to the supervised learning? Or what was the motivation in doing those works? Um, no, this is a, I mean, we didn't look at this, so I didn't. So okay. this, is a, this is a meta study. Yeah. So this, even this, this data set, so this is a, 
It was a meta study over semi supervised learning where they just apply different methods to different data sets. So I think it's all done in a, in a very similar way. It's just they applied it to different data sets. So. I'm not saying we are solving like a, a huge thing here. It's just something to, to think about. So the, where you have a connection between these causal ideas um, and some problem that where you would at first glance uh, think this is, should not be related to causality. Yeah. This is the um, sort of improvement that you get by using unlabeled data. And you want to be above the line, right? Because you want the unlabeled data to help. And what you see here, by the way, I mean, maybe I, sh I should stress this again. So this assumption, what is it? So we are saying that the decision boundary, this depends. So this lies in a low density region. What are we doing there? We are exactly establishing a link between p of y given x and p of x. Because we are saying the decision boundary, this red line, this is exactly a property of this guy, of the distribution of y given x, right? This lies in a region where p of x is small. So what are you doing is you're exactly, you're, the core of your assumption is to establish a link between the, the conditional and the marginal here. Yeah? It's sort of awesome. The difference between like observational versus like interventional. Because like, like if you're, what you're doing is you're, if you're predicting from an observational standpoint, and you're trying to predict the next one from again an observational data. And this, then the semi-supervised like uh, approach seems to sort of work because that's in the similar context. Whether, but but your assumption of modul modularity is kind of very precisely in the interventional. But this is a very good comment. Yeah. Um, so, I mean here. This is now uh, this is a bit philosophical, but I think it relates to this point. Um, so we have these independences really on, on two different levels, and I try to connect them, and maybe this picture clarifies, I hope. Some of their different versions of saying, we, we call this the independence of mechanism. So this is what I talked about, what you are calling um, interventions. So when you're saying this is this modularity, it has many different names, also intervenability or autonomy uh, or transfer or something. So when you're saying, well, whenever I'm intervening on one of these equations, the other remain the same. So this is a very interventional sort of setting, right? And this is one aspect of what we call the independence of mechanisms. So you intervene somewhere and something else remains the same. But I think that this is uh, the, the concept that we are using here in semi-supervised learning. This is more like what maybe you would call an observational statement. And this is somewhat about the independence of information contained in the mechanism. So this is really, it's not so much about intervention, but it's really saying that somewhat this object here does not contain uh, joint information with this object. I know that I'm very vague here. There are a couple of ways of making this um, uh, formal, for example, with using Kolmogorov complexity. So of course, then the question is how to compute this. But there, at least mathematically, you can try to formalize what you mean by sort of these things being, being independent. And this, I think, this is what we are using here in the semi-supervised learning setting. This I just used for motivating sort of this, this assumption here. There's a third aspect that, I, that we here call independence of noises or conditional independence structures. Um, this is just saying, and this is of course also high level, but maybe the intuition helps. So this is saying this independence assumption is actually closely related to this. So when you're saying x is just noise and y is let's say x squared plus some noise, what you're saying now is that somehow this conditional distribution here of y given x is somehow the, the important part in this conditional distribution if you condition on a small value of x, it's just this noise, right? And you are saying that this noise should be independent of x. So again, this is roughly related to say, well, the, they are the input so that the x is somewhat specified by the noise distribution and the conditional somewhat specified by this noise distribution. And again, these are now statistically independent. So this is the, the third box that in this sense, at least the high level is related. But this is a, I think it's an interesting point because the, uh, this concept here, you can actually also use for a causal discovery, for causal structure learning. Um, how is it done? So I don't have a slide on this, but just to get an idea and you don't have to talk about details, but maybe that you can see like there's really like many open ideas and many ways of trying to think about causal discovery methods. So what is done is 
for example, to say, now a very simple setting, but imagine you have some distribution over x, so I'm now plotting the density that maybe looks like this, and we have a, careful now, we have a functional relationship that may look like this. So let's say for the sake of the argument, this is a deterministic relationship, so y is just f of x. If you now plug in sort of this distribution through the function, you get a marginal distribution of y, of course, right? And how does it look like? Well, you get some sort of a peak in these low density regions, right? So it may look like a bit like this. I'm not very good in drawing. Maybe something like this. So you start with x, you have some distribution x, you plug it through this function, and then you get some output distribution over y. So now if you look at this, and if you believe, <laughs> if you strongly believe in this principle of independence of mechanisms, then actually this tells you how to do causal inference. Because now if you would look at the opposite direction, so how to, perf like how to obtain x from y, what you see is actually, this is a bit suspicious. Because now what you find is that the sort of in the opposite direction is, uh, of course, the high, um, high derivative regions, they coincide with high density regions. So in this sense, if this is your, if this is your data set, then somewhat you would prefer x causing y because you're saying, well, if it would be y causing x, I would have a very weird coincidence where like large density regions and y coincide with some properties of these functions. So this is, uh, this is one way of, for example, using this, this principle for even causal inference. So this is, yeah, I think, is quite interesting to think about these things. Super important for the whole concept of causality, and this is something one can even try to exploit for, for causal inference here. Okay, th so this was one sort of small uh, comment on semi-supervised learning. Are there questions about this? Good. So the next one, this is an application um, uh, that I think is also fun. So this is about exoplanet search. So it's called half-sibling regression, but uh, I'm actually not claiming that we are the first ones who are using such a method. I think there are probably other people who have done this before. It's just about uh, phrasing it maybe in a causal context. So what is the problem? So here we have, um, we have a, uh, the Kepler telescope. This is pointed at a certain direction in the, uh, in the space. And so here you see the, what we call the Swan in German. What is it? Cygnus. I don't know how you pronounce this. And uh, you may not recognize this constellation here of stars. Um, so the idea is to find exoplanets. And how does it do it? So here you see the sort of the direction at which uh, the telescope points at. Here you see the uh, position. So here's the sun. So this is the Milky Way galaxy. So these telescopes are pretty amazing. So the search space is over 3,000 light years. And what, are, what is the goal here in this, um, in this question? So the goal is to find exoplanets. And how does it work? So this is the, the idea. So you have, over time, you're measuring the light intensity. So you're looking at one star, and then you're measuring the light intensity of the star over time. And the hope is now to find data that looks as follows. So that is rather constant over time. And then it has a certain dip, and then it goes up again, and then it has a dip again, and then it goes up again. Because if you have such a regular dip, you can infer that, aha, uh -huh, probably there was a planet that is orbiting the star that uh, leads to a decrease in the, in the light intensity here. That is one way of uh, sort of trying to detect uh, exoplanets. And of course, these, uh, the data, as you can imagine, this doesn't look like this, but it more looks like this. So now the question is, uh, can we find somehow these dips in the, um, in the light intensity curve? The problem set up clear? So how does causality come into play here? Um, so this is a sort of a toy model of the causal structure that underlies this. And it's simplifying in many ways, but still hopefully it's a useful simplification. So what we have is unobserved. We have somewhat the true signal um, of the star, of the light intensity of the, of the combination of star and planet. Then we have the measurement, and this measurement will be a noisy version of this, uh, of this star, right? Why? Because there are many problems. I mean, there are like, uh, this is like, if you measure something that is 3,000 light years away, uh, there will be a lot of noise in your signal. But now this is what we are going to exploit. So we are measuring this 
with a certain telescope, with a certain measuring device, but at the same time, we are measuring many, many other stars as well. So these are other measurements from other stars that we might also be interested in. And now, so this is observed. We are measuring this sort of star-planet combination, and we are measuring many other of these combinations as well. And this is what we are trying to, uh, to reconstruct. Because then, if you have a nice reconstruction of your uh, light intensity signal, you can infer these planets, the existence of planets. So now, what are we doing? So if you, if you look at this picture, what you find is that these, these other measurements, they are also caused by some star-planet um, combinations. The assumption now is that they are independent of the uh, true signal that we are interested in. And why is this the case? Because they are light years away from each other. So there's very little reason to believe that sort of two different stars that we are measuring that are in completely different areas of the space are sort of influencing uh, each other. So this is our assumption that we are saying, well, these other measurements are truly independent um, uh, of these measurements and everything that is so of the tr true signal, sorry, and everything that is common in the measurements must be due to systematic noise. So whenever you see something that in this signal that looks very much like something in this signal, then it must be due to the measurement of the uh, to the same measurement device. And this is uh, why. Um, so I joined this uh, project rather late and do a bit of to do a bit of the theory, but this is why uh, they came up with this idea of half sibling regression because these are really like half siblings here. OK, so uh, this is again so, uh, the same uh, setup now with random variables. So we are saying we have some unobserved, um, unobserved variables. What we observe is y and x. And here you can think of the measurement of many other stars. And now, so this will be a bit of a toy theory. But if you assume that the noise acts in an additive way, so here, this looks a bit funny because now the Q is really what we are interested in. So the, uh, the signal Y is a combination of the systematic noise and the true signal that we want to recover. And now what is the proposed idea? So we want to denoise the signal, right? So we want to remove the influence from the measurement device in order to reconstruct Q. So what, I'm suggest what we are suggesting to do is we're saying, well, we should remove everything from Y that can be explained by X. Because everything that can be explained by x must be due to the, to the same uh, measurement device. OK, so a uh, different way of writing this is to say, well, we reconstruct Q by just removing everything that we can explain. So we are removing, basically, the conditional expectation of y given x. OK, and then I mean, you can do some, uh, some theory. I mean, I'm not sure how. Uh, sensible the assumptions here are, but at least they're telling you that you're not doing something entirely stupid. So you converge against the correct signal. Here you have to be a bit careful. I mean, you can um, only reconstruct something up to reparameterization. Um, and you can reconstruct it if, for example, the, the whole influence of this, this systematic noise, you can actually reconstruct by a function of x. This, is, of course, is a very idealist uh, idealistic scenario, this will not always be true, but at least if this is the case, then you can prove very easily that uh, you can actually recover the correct, uh, correct signal Q. Or another one, this is a bit more realistic, I think. Um, so, I mean, in some settings where you have very little noise, so basically where X, of course, recovers everything from, uh, or it contains all the information from N, then of course I can recover this, uh, this true signal. And the other one, this is the one, sorry, that I meant is a bit more realistic in our scenario. So if you have not only one measurement, but if you have many, 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 many other measurements as well, then you can sort of use all of them sort of to remove everything in Y uh, that is explained by these axes. And if you have many of these axes, you can hope to sort of remove almost everything from N here. That's sort of the, the intuition. How does it look like in practice? So here, this is a light curve that you expect. And this is an, an easy case, maybe even. So what you see is this is the light intensity over time. And this is the signal. Um, and what you see is that, for example, here there are some gaps. And as I learned, this is always when this Kepler telescope points back to the Earth and sends the signal. So you get the same gaps, like regular gaps. I think it's one, once per month or something. don't remember. And then what you see is that um, also you have these dips. And these already indicate, so here you see it actually quite nicely. So here these, this indicates the existence of an exoplanet. 
And this is what you get if you apply this half-sibling regression. So um, you see, for example, that the drift can be removed very easily because this you see in all the stars. What is the drift here? So the drift is because apparently the telescope is a bit broken, so it's not stable anymore and it always shifts a bit. So what happens is that some stars um, move in the pixels, so they overlap to the pixels. But this is something that you, of course, see in all the measurements of the other stars as well. And then you know, aha, this must be systematic noise. So we are just removing it. So the drift is something very easy. But also here, these, these smaller dips, for example, you can remove very nicely. So this is the method that we are proposing with the half-sibling regression. This is a state of the art. I mean, here, this is an easy case. So here, you see the dips of the uh, exoplanet very nicely and uh, like very regularly orbiting the, the star. Uh, this is maybe a bit more noisy. So here in the original data, it's not so clear, I would say, whether there's a planet or not. I mean, if you're a bit uh, used to this data, maybe you can see that, but for me it was a bit harder. Uh, but indeed here, uh, if you now sort of do this systematic noise removal, you also see that now it becomes a bit clearer, that there seems to be a regular dip. Okay, I mean, you can also do this more systematically. I mean, you have to look at the papers here, but uh, apparently even like uh, you are beating the state-of-the-art method, and uh, so this is done with some astronomers in New York, and apparently some of the exoplanets have now been confirmed. So uh, this method found a couple of new ones, and apparently they know now that they are existing. Yeah, no matter whether this is relevant for our life, but <laughs> at least they exist, yeah. So, I mean, given that you know that part of the mechanism is, say, shifting, you know, can you use a better model than an additive model? So, you know, than just something, you know, it sounds like you can use this knowledge in order to yeah, I think mm -hmm, that's a good question. So can we do something more intelligent than just removing and uh, just subtracting this? Uh, one has to be a bit careful, I think, to a certain extent, yes. So it's difficult to come up with a very general technique, I think, that is different from this. But if you know, for example, this shifting, then you can indeed do it. Um, the shifting, anyhow, anyhow, this is very easy to remove, I think, because you, this you see very clearly. I think the bit more tricky are these smaller dips here. But this is indeed something that I think they, they have looked at yeah, to sort of improve this idea. But again, so the general idea here, just show this once more, is to say, well, I mean, it's, it's not that this is magic or anything, but if you, if you draw the causal structure, it's obvious, right? So you're saying, well, if this is the causal structure, then all the information that is contained in both x and y must be due to the systematic noise, so we can try to remove it. Yeah. What is the functional form of the noise? So would you actually know the... No, this the you don't have to assume anything about, right? So here you're just saying, so you're observing y and x, and what are you doing? You're trying now to predict y from x. And of course, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit uh, sort of uh, simplifying here, because in the data set that we are applying this, uh, this uh, method to, of course, we have a time series structure, and you should account for this. So but the idea is you should try to predict y from x. Same additive noise. It just the, the, the reason I ask the question is that yeah, but they, here yeah. you don't have to assume additive noise. I mean, we are we are writing this only in in terms of like finding the propositions. But I think I mean, okay, this is a bit hand wavy. But I think the concept is a bit more general. This additive noise only helps you because you are sort of subtracting this thing here. But the the overall idea of saying that um, the the signal that is shared between X and Y must be due to the systematic noise. I think this is more general, and it can be applied to other models as well. Yeah. Good. Uh, the second idea, and I, as I said, so I hopefully this this is only. I mean, it's not nowhere sort of a full story here. These are only sort of ideas or hints where these two fields uh, could touch or could benefit uh, from each other. Any other question about the half-sibling regression? Good, then I would like to do uh, one more idea. This is reinforcement learning. So what are we doing here? Um, so if you think about back about this uh, kidney stones example, um, so this is just the same story, but now I'm writing in a slightly different way, and then we will see that this relates to reinforcement learning. Yeah? Question on the previous one. Uh, how does it relate to? Uh, can you cross formulate it as a as a just a multivariate regression? Um, yeah, 
can do, I think. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a very simple idea, no? So this is the denoising strategy. And I think I would not be surprised that if in other fields people would do this like uh, even intuitively. I wouldn't be surprised because this is somehow, I mean, what you're doing is you're measuring independent signals, no? And this, the idea to say, I mean, it's a bit of a trick, but I think people have probably done it before to say, well, if I have something that should be independent, but that's not, then this is some, to do to something that I won't want to look at. I want to remove this first. And in a way, this, is a, this, you, can, this you can see as a multivariate regression, right? In a time series setting, it's a some, something slightly more complicated, uh, but in a way, this is really a regression. So in a regression, we always try to find the conditional expectation. Yeah. Good. So um, what about this kidney stone example? So here you see once more this uh, Markov factorization. So we have the recovery, the uh, size of the stone and the treatment, and we have this causal graph here. So in very small, you find the structural causal models. Another way to write down the Markov condition is to say, well, the joint factorizes in these three factors. So this is R given T and S, T given S, and this is just P of S. And the question we were asking is, what would happen if, right? So we wanted to intervene on the treatment. So how does it look like? I mean, we know how to intervene on a structural causal model. How does this look like in this, in this Markov factorization? So I didn't say this explicitly, but maybe you can already guess. So what you are doing is you are replacing this factor. This is the same thing, right? And this, this hopefully makes sense, because if you remind yourself of these factors, they correspond to these structural equations. So each of these factors corresponds to one of these structural equations. So this one, R as a function of S and T, corresponds to this conditional. This one here corresponds to this conditional. And now what happens if you're intervening, we are just replacing this part in the, uh, in the Markov factorization. Again, you also very nicely again see the modularity assumption, right? It says whenever you're intervening on T, all the rest remains the same. It's exactly here. So these factors remain the same. The only thing that you change is this factor. This is something that is called the truncated Markov factorization, especially if you set this to a value of 3 you lose this factor, right? So you get an indicator function over, over 3. This is a very, has very different names, uh, G formula as well, I think. Um, but this is a very, for, very famous sort of uh, description of saying what happens in an intervention. It's the same thing as we defined it. So now what you can do is you can replace this, of course, not only by a constant. You can not only set this to 13, but you can ask the question, well, what, what would be actually the best uh, sort of distribution of treatments. In our case, in this kidney stone example, we have computed everything. We know, well, treatment A was just always better than treatment B. So there, what we want to do is we always want to use treatment A. So in a way, this doesn't depend on the size of the stone because for all the subcategories, treatment A was better. So just always use treatment A. But there was, in fact, a, a question about this yesterday um, that was going like follows. It was saying, well, can we actually also say that maybe the best treatment does depend on some of the covariates, right? So maybe the treatment, which treatment to use, does indeed depend on the size of the stone. What do we do then? And this is one of these uh, sort of interventions you would u then use. So you are saying, well, maybe the thing that I used in the study was not optimal. I want to replace it by something else, by something that works better. Okay, so in this sense, this is a more general intervention. So we are replacing this conditional by a different conditional that I call uh, P star here. And the question is, well, what is the optimal choice? And now, of course, I have to say, what do I mean by optimal? Um, so this is one of the questions you could ask. So let's say we have one variable that we are particularly interested in. So for example, the recovery. We want to, most people to recover. So then the question we are asking is, how shall we choose this conditional, this p star, such that we get the best value possible for the expected recovery? Does this make sense? And this is something that we are, we are now coming close, <laughs> close to reinforcement learning, I, I think. Because what in reinforcement learning, what we are doing is we are saying we have a couple of actions that we can choose that may depend on the state. Uh, so maybe this is our action here, the t. The state is the... Uh, sort of the size of the stone is the state, and depending on the state, we may want to uh, sort of choose a different action. So what we are doing is we are playing around with this, this factor here. Okay, so this is a bit of a fun application maybe. Um, what we did is we, we thought we can apply this to 
uh, to blackjack. So I'm not sure whether you're familiar with blackjack. I'm just going over the, the rules here. Um, so we have uh, sort of a dealing part. So uh, each player gets two cards. The dealer uh, gets one card and all are face up. So this is a casino game where you play against the bank, I, to, I should say. And the goal is to have more points in your hand uh, than your opponent. So how do you count the points? Uh, the face cards, like king and queen and so on and jack, are 10 points. And the ace uh, is sort of a special card because it can either count 1 or 11 points, whatever is more convenient for you. So why do you ever want to sort of uh, use one point? We will see in a second. So what are the moves you can do? So at each, it's a, you play it in rounds. And at each point, you can choose between three or four different uh, different moves. The first one is to say hit, then you get another card. So why don't you always want to say hit? Because you lose as soon as if you're over 21, right? So you take a card, but you always try to remain smaller than 21. This is why an ace is a nice card, right? Because an ace, you can, you can choose, if you would have been 23, you can choose, aha, okay, I now use the ace as a one instead of an 11. Stand, what does stand mean? Stand is, um, uh, you just say, okay, I'm, I'm done now. I don't want to have another card. Double down is something interesting where you sort of say, okay, I'm, I believe I have a very good card. So I double my, um, so, so you bet at the beginning $1, and then you say, well, I double my bet. And I, I think in most casinos you play it like you take one more card and then you stop. So this double down always means double my bet, take one more card, and then I, I uh, stand afterwards. And the split, this is something that you can do, uh, do in case of a pair. So if you have two jacks, for example, you can say I split. So you split your two cards, and then you can play with two hands uh, and continue. What are the dealer's moves? So the dealer starts um, playing until, like, after you are done. And the moves are deterministic. So you do something, and then at some point you're saying, OK, I'm done, or maybe you have, I think it's called busted or something, where you have like more than 25, 21 points. And then the dealer starts. So it's a deterministic rule. It says you always hit. The dealer always hits. Um, and he does not stand before he has uh, at least 17 points. So when he has 16 points, he takes one more card. Um, and he stops whenever he has 17 or more points. And why is this called blackjack? Blackjack is a certain hand. It's an ace and a face card. Um, this is nice because it's exactly 21. So this is a very good, very good hand. Um, and in some of the casinos you are playing, uh, I think you get 1.5 times your bet back. Um, so why is this a, a nice game for the casino? It looks like the casino is actually bet, uh, worse off, no? Because the player can always do, decide what he wants to do, but the dealer has a deterministic strategy. So how can this ever be a good game for the bank? And what's the trick here? Is this, this a nice game for the casino? Yeah. First. Yeah, and why is this good? Because I can decide. Because he may bust and I may not. So. Uh, exactly, and I think the, uh, this is the, exactly the right idea. And the precise uh, argument is that if both players uh, sort of bust, then the bank wins because the player indeed busts first, right? So imagine that you have both have a strategy and both bust, then the bank win because the player plays first, right? So if he is busted, then he, he loses. So this is the only advantage from the casino. So uh, any, everything else, also this 1.5 and so on, is in favor of uh, sort of the player, but this is the only part that favors the bank. And what is nice about this game, where we looked at this, is that the optimal strategy is known. This is a paper, a math paper that you can have a look at. Um, and it's actually, a, I think it's a rather nice, nice and simple uh, simple strategy that you can look up and uh, you know what the perfect strategy is. And this is, by the way, one of the games where you, so if you want to go to a casino, you're losing money anyhow, but uh, then you should play this one because this is the game where on average you lose the least money. So if you play, like optimally, I think you're losing, I don't remember, a couple of percent of your, of your bet, I think. And of course, you know, all know these movies, if you start counting cards, then you can actually beat the casino. Yeah. So here you see this, these rules and actions. Uh, so let, let's see whether we see what happens. So the, the dealer has an ace here. So let's first look at this guy. So he has two fives. Apparently he has decided to split, right? So uh, he has the two fives. So he plays with two hands. Here he takes a seven. 
then he has 12, um, he takes one more card, then he has 21, and this is a very good hand, so we will see that the, the dealer, what does the, the dealer do? He has this deterministic strategy, it's very hard to read from the back, I guess, but he has an ace and a six, so it's 17 points, and this is better than 17 points, uh, so uh, here the player wins. What happened here? So here the player, on this hand, he played until he was 16, so uh, he, he loses his money on, uh, on this hand. Let's look at this guy. So he had 20. He apparently, aha, uh -huh, so he may have, no, this is just the, the win, I think. So here he just decided to stand, no? And here this guy, what happened to this guy? He had a two and an ace. He draw another card, a king, then the ace counted as one. So he is 13, 16, and he also loses. So hopefully the idea, idea is clear. So how do we do this now in uh, causality? How do we play? So what is the idea? So we say, we, what are the objects of interest here? So we have some, um, some random variables that, that describe our situation. So let's say the dealer hand and our hand and so on. Um, and what you do is you get a sample from this joint observation. So you have a certain strategy that you play and uh, you get your sample and these are the games. Then you have the function of interest this is, of course, also a function that is a deterministic function of all the random variables, and this is just the money that you win or lose. And then what you have is um, you have a strategy, and this strategy is just one of these Markov kernels. So it's, if you, you can represent it as this. So you say it's a conditional of y given x, and x is sort of the game state. So x is sort of your hand. You have to parameterize this a bit, but this is your hand and uh, maybe the dealer hand, and then you are always deciding what do I do? So why is now the decision? Do I hit, stand, uh, double down, or split, or whatever is possible here? And now what is this intervention? So we are replacing this strategy by something else. And this is really just an intervention. It fits very nicely, I think, in the causal language. So the strategy is the decisions given the game state. So now the questions that we, we have is what is the sort of the expected uh, what is the expected loss under a certain strategy P star? And this is something that we would like to estimate. And again, so what is nice now, I think, is that sort of you don't have to know the rules. So the, the game is now set up that you have a machine that goes enters the casino and has no idea what the rules of blackjack are, but it is trying to, to learn it by itself. And of course, this is something you can also do with reinforcement learning. We are just phrasing this as a causality problem here. So this is sort of the question, right? So maybe you have been playing for a long time, like under a certain strategy, and you have received a certain loss. So this is how it goes. This is how your data look like. So let's look at the example of blackjack. So the xi's maybe are like your, this is one of the x's, this is your hand, and um, sort of your, this is your decision, whether you hit or stand or uh, double down or whatever. And there are many variables that you don't know that determine, of course, the game. For example, the, the hidden deck. What is the hidden deck? The only thing that you observe is this loss function, and this is just the result of the game. So this is what you're interested in. You're interested in the loss function of these, these variables. And now the question is, well, we have been playing with a certain strategy, and now we want to know what would have happened if we had played a different strategy. So this is an interventional question. So you're trying to answer what is the expected loss if I intervene and if I use a different strategy here. And what is needed to answer this question is really only the values of x and y. This is what we need, and this is, makes sense, right? This is our strategy, so uh, you better remember what you played in which situation. And then what you don't need is, for example, z, but what you do need is the outcome of the game. Okay, this is a formula that is much, uh, <laughs> much easier than it looks. So we are assuming now we are replacing our strategy that we have used for the first hour by something else. So what are we interested in? We are interested in the expected value of the loss under this new strategy. If you write it down, it's just an integral, right? We are integrating over this new density, and now it's very trivial. Now what you're doing is you're dividing and multiplying by the, the old density, and what do, you, uh, what do you get? Well, this factor here is very easy, right? Because this thing is exactly the same. They only differ in one factor, which is our strategy. So what you're doing here, and this reminds you hopefully of something like uh, uh, importance sampling. So what you're doing here is this factor here, is exactly the same as this factor because all the components, if you look at the factorization of the Markov factorization, everything remains the same except for your strategy. You're only changing the strategy. So this is why you get uh, this ratio here. And this is now something that we can, uh, we can compute. So this we can estimate. 
And this, I think, is nice. So we are playing with the strategy P. We are playing for a long time, and we are, we are wondering, well, what is the expected loss under a new strategy? And this you can just uh, do by reweighting your samples. So how do you estimate this integral here? Well, basically, it's not so difficult, right? So this is an integral, and of course, we approximate it by a finite sum. So and how do we do it? We just sum over our data points that we have. And this, is, this we can compute, right? So the loss, this is the money that we made or lo lost. So this we know for each of the games that we played. This is our strategy. This is what we know. And this is, this is, sorry, this is the strategy that we used, and this is the strategy that we are interested in. So if you do this, what you get is you get an answer to the question, well, what is roughly the expected money uh, that I would have gotten if I had used a different strategy here? Yeah? In your previous paper, uh, is it explicit this P star of when you get This is the looks on the right. Um, yeah, so this is something that you specify, yeah, indeed. So the, the, the point is you, you start, you enter the casino, you're saying, okay, I start with a random strategy. I always decide 25%, and then what you're trying to answer is, well, what would have happened if I had used a slightly different strategy? And this slightly different strategy you have to specify, indeed, yeah, the P star is known. Thanks a lot. Uh, this is the next slide, yeah. I mean, here, I'm not showing you this, but of course, you can compute confidence intervals, everything that's not so easy. So if you want to optimize, so the question is, which P star is the best? And we are doing exactly what you are su suggesting. Um, we are doing it step by step. So you parameterize this, this strategy by some parameters, and you're just computing the, the gradient. This is all possible. And then how do you optimize? Well, you just use the gradient, and then you do step by step. And if you like, you can do some very fancy techniques. So confidence the interval, step size, and so on, this is all like what you're used to these optimization problems. So. How to exploit the causal structure? And this is now is something, uh, uh, this is something very trivial that you would have done anyhow, but this may tell you a bit like um, why this would help phrasing it as a causal problem. So this is a very simplified structure here, but the way whether you lose money or not, of course, depends on your decision you are doing and on the open cards and the hidden cards. And now if someone tells you, again, it's a toy example, but if somebody tells you that the, 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 so the, the point, the fact whether you lose or win, does in fact only depend on the suit of the card, uh, does not depend on the suit of the card because the value is not determined by the suit, you can include this in this graph. So you can say, well, in fact, somebody tells you this some uh, background knowledge, um, the suit does not matter, then what you can show very easily, then your decision also, I mean, it has, doesn't have to be based on the, on the open cards. So a bit of a trivial statement, we will see a, another example after the break for advertisement where can, you can do the same thing. So here, Again, there's, there's a lot of room, but this is maybe a glimpse of saying, okay, how does the causal structure here come into play? But it's still at its infancy, I think. Does it work? It works very nicely. Uh, I don't have this here. We compare this against like simple uh, multi-arm bandage problems. Uh, but here, what you see is the, um, this is sort of the money that you lose over a lot of different games. And it's not surprising that it works, um, but here you see the optimal strategy. So you see that it's very close to zero. Um, I think like something like two or three cents or so. And what you do now is um, you always have a current strategy. You start by losing quite a bit. And then what, what I think is nice is with this approach, you get very natural confidence bounds. So what you're always doing is you're always predicting and saying, okay, now I changed this strategy a tiny bit towards a direction that seemed uh, uh, very successful, so I'm performing this intervention, and I always get a confidence bound what I expect my uh, sort of method to, how I expect my method to perform. And what you see is that, um, I mean, roughly it looks like that the uh, sort of the strategy, this the blue one, uh, fits very nicely into this in, into this confidence band. And then at least it comes uh, very close to the uh, to the optimal strategy. You can play a bit around with this, but this was not our point here. So this is just for. Um, uh, presentation purposes. But this is how you can also view like reinforcement learning sort of type of problems as a causal inference. Uh, good. I think uh, we do like uh, one question and then a break. Yeah. Uh, the contents levels are so small from the beginning and do not get smaller. Like, you start with more samples. Mm -hmm. this is a, we will see this in a second. The confidence bands, I think this is, a, it depends on what you think is interesting. I think it is interesting. They consist of two different parts. 
So one part is about uh, how many data points you actually have in order to estimate this uh, expected value, right? It should be low at the start, right? Yes, but now comes the point. The second part is how far um, are you away from the, um, from the strategy that you are querying? Because um, if you are sort of querying a, like a strategy that is very far from what you have played before, then what you get is, and this looks a bit innocent, but these weights that you get, you have to reweight your sort of data points, right? So this will, these will get a, a super large variance. Um, and this leads to a, a large confidence interval. So these confidence intervals, they contain two different parts. One is how many data points did I receive? So in order to estimate sort of the expectation here. And the other one, the other part is how far is actually my P star from the P? And this is why uh, you see that the, the confidence interval doesn't decrease a lot because if you are here, then sort of these, these games that you played under this strategy are useless. You're basically not looking at them because they, these, these weights will be uh, extremely small. Yeah. Any other questions about this? Yeah? Uh, it's only, right? it seems to be it seems to me? No, it seems to be only increasing. Um, yeah, that's uh, what we hope, no? Yeah, but, but wouldn't it have to have make some false uh, guesses to them? Uh, yeah, but this is, they, they are, you're doing a lot of fair mistakes here at the beginning. So what this means is that uh, here you're losing a lot of money, right? So you're randomly guessing. So you have very bad strategy. You, are, you can say your P, your strategy P, this one Markov factor, is very far away from the optimal strategy. Uh, and you're doing a lot of mistakes. And now what you're doing is you're always computing the direction in which to optimize. And this is, for example, uh, if you have, let's say, what you realize very quickly is when you have 21 points, that it's a very good idea to stand. And then you see, OK, so this is one parameter of your high dimensional theta, right? So whenever you have 21 points, you see Im immediately that you get a pretty good gradient into this direction to say, I should stand. And this is why you would hope that you are increasing, sort of. Yeah? The computation of the gradient, is it, is it an uh, analytical or more numerical computation of the? No, you can do this analytical. And you can also get, um, uh, you can also get sort of confidence intervals for the gradient. Um, what is a bit funny uh, is one has to be a bit, uh, this is hidden here. So these weights that you may know this from other scenarios, this happens all the time. So these weights here, um, they are very badly behaved because what you can see is that it's some, in some situations, when, especially when these, this P gets very small, for example, um, then you get very large weights, which is quite bad. So you have, this is, I think, the part that is a bit, uh, requires some thought. So there are a couple of strategies that you can look in the literature. I think this is, this is quite crucial. The gradient you can just write down analytically. Yeah. Uh, automatic differentiation or things like that? I, mean, you know. I never thought about it, so maybe you could, yeah. I could, I could imagine, yeah. But in a way, it's not, if you write, I mean, I didn't write down the formula, but if you do a pen on paper, just take the derivative here with respect to the parameter. It's not very difficult, yeah. Okay, so let's do a, a break and then uh, continue at 10 past or so. Good, so maybe we can continue. Um, I'm pretty sure we don't need the full next hour, but I've been uh, over time a couple of times, so I think you get back some of the time that I used up. Uh, so I, I just so here what we are doing is we connected this reinforcement learning with uh, causal inference ideas. This is actually a toy scenario where we have done this in a more realistic scenario, not for blackjack. Um, it was this advertisement setting, and very uh, uh, briefly here you see the structure again that I mentioned already yesterday. So um, it's a similar setup as in the blackjack. So here, instead of money, you want to receive clicks. You have a couple of hidden variables, the user intention, for example, you have a lot of user data. And then you have this, for example, this parameter mainline reserve um, and the number of ads in the mainline. And so you can do basically the same story as before. So here, what is our strategy? The strategy is how to set the mainline reserve. This is a real valued parameter that determines how many ads are shown in the mainline, so above the search results. And so the, your strategy is now to say uh, roughly, so what is the conditional of this uh, mainline reserve given the user data? Something that maybe I wasn't uh, 
um, entirely precise about last time. So what is very important if you want to do these uh, these uh, this, uh, strategy changes, of course you have to randomize, right? So hopefully this is clear. It doesn't work if this is a deterministic function. So if you're always choosing the mainline reserve to be twice the age of the uh, user whatsoever, then you cannot uh, sort of you cannot query what happens under a new distribution because the the uh, sort of ratio will be ill-defined, right? So this is something where you have to randomize, and this is joint work with Leon Botu, and he told me that it was actually not so easy to convince uh, the managers there. Uh, this was at Microsoft Research uh, to actually uh, include a lot of randomization. Because, of course, you think that you know the best mainline reserve given the user data, but if you want to optimize this, then uh, you need to include some randomization. And, very importantly, you have to uh, lock all these things, right? So this is a practical issue. So you have to not only randomize, but you have to store what kind of mainline reserve you choose. So in the blackjack example, this means you are randomizing your strategy at the beginning, but also you have to sort of remember what you played in a given situation. Otherwise, sort of these update rules don't, don't work. Yeah, this is not, I mean, um, placing advertisements is something fun to play with, but I wouldn't do it for the rest of my life, so that's why I didn't spend so much time explaining it. So um, what does it mean? So you have, you are searching for something, um, and then so you're looking for organic uh, oranges, and then what you find is you find uh, some search results, and I really encourage you to switch off your ad block plus for an hour or so, so what you get is that here are the search results, and here you get some ads. And they are sometimes they have a bit of a gray shading, sometimes they have a small AD in front of it, and here are some, it looks a bit like a search results, but these are actually ads. And they are always between, for some reasons that I never understood, but they are always between zero and four mainline ads. So these are the mainline ads. And how many of these mainline ads you show, this is determined by the mainline reserve. And this is just a real valued parameter. So if this is very large, then you show many ads. If this is very small, you show very few ads. It's not so trivial, because if you want to, so now, I'm not sure whether I included a slide for this, but now if you want to do this optimization, you have to be a bit careful, because we want to receive more clicks. And this is the strategy we can play with. But of course, you don't want to just show more ads. And this is if you just in, in, uh, improve, uh, like want to optimize the number of clicks, what you will end up with is just always show ads, because then people will just randomly click on it uh, and not knowing that it's an ad instead of a search result. And this is what you want to avoid, because then people get annoyed by your search uh, engine uh, and then use something else. So there's a long-term effect, right? So what do you do in practice? Uh, in practice, but this is all, I mean, it's, it's very, I mean, it's very simple mathematics, of course. So what you do is you're computing a gradient, so that says in which direction you should move your parameters in order to receive more clicks, but then you're projecting it down onto the um, sort of subspace in which all the number of ads are remaining constant. So you're saying which is the direction that, that makes me receive more and more clicks, given the constraint that I'm not showing more ads. So in some situations you want to do this, but of course it's just a simple projection, so you can easily compute these things. But in this, this case here, you want to do that. Okay, so let me see whether I included some information about this. Um, yeah, so this is what you can do, and, and here, uh, these are sort of the, the figures that you will see. So this is the uh, sort of the mainline reserve. Uh, that you're currently using under a certain strategy, and then you can compute these, these things. So here, uh, this is, I mean, of course, it's difficult to uh, parameterize because it's a conditional distribution, but you can think of saying, okay, for a certain uh, sort of uh, user data, here including the, in increasing the mainline reserve will actually decrease the number um, of uh, clicks. And this is your current strategy, and this is sort of uh, the thing that you are, uh, suggesting what will happen if you change it by 50%. And this is what I mentioned before. Here you see the nicely the two different intervals. So the one interval is due to like uh, not having a lot of data points, and the other one is due to um, sort of being far away from the stra current strategy. And here you see, for example, that this this guy is really blowing up. So because we have no, because of our randomization, we are randomizing a bit here, but we never see parameters here. So this is why here we are super uncertain because we just have no data. In this, in this region. And then what you do is this point here now is the sort of uh, this thing that you try. So the, you're, you're running your current strategy, and after a while you're wondering, well, what would have happened if I had used 
sort of this uh, change here, this main learning reserve. And what you see is then you can run the experiment and just try this out on a couple of days of data. And you see, aha, indeed, this lies into, the, into this confidence intervals. It's, I think it's, so this worked pre pretty nicely. Where does the causality come into play? So why is this uh, interesting to talk about causality? And this is, again, something that I think you can formulate without causality. But with causality, it's super natural. If you look at this uh, uh, sort of if, at this graph, you realize one thing. So somehow, the effect whether a person clicks on the ad or not, this of course depends on what the user is looking for. I mean, maybe he doesn't want to buy organic oranges. Uh, he just wants to uh, see. Um, I don't know. Uh, whether they are, on average, smaller than non-organic oranges or something. So there's some user intention that determines whether the person clicks on an ad. But the user never sees the mainline reserve. This is a real number that, of course, is not published by, uh, by Bing. It does not say, OK, we have used the mainline, mainline reserve 2.78. The person only sees sort of the number of ads in the mainline. So if you have two different uh, mainline reserves, let's say 2.7 and 3.4, that lead to exactly the same uh, number of ads in the mainline. In a way, you do not want to distinguish between these, uh, these two different mainline reserves. And this is very, uh, sort of very straightforward if you look at this graph, right? So the mainline reserve doesn't influence the click directly. It only goes via this number of ads in the mainline. And this is what you can exploit in, the, uh, in this whole procedure. I'm not showing the details here, but we have, if you remind, our, so if you, we remind ourselves, we have these factors, these ratios. And the thing is that uh, sort of some of these ratios are very large, and some of them, are, many of them are very small, so they are sort of badly behaved. But now what you can do is you can make them much easier behaved by sort of writing this factor in terms of this uh, number of ads in the main line. So you're sort of grouping a lot of these mainline reserves together. So your ratio gets much better behaved. Why? Because now this is really a discrete number here. So this is either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So the, these ratios uh, will remain uh, much better behaved. And what this leads to is this was the old picture that you get. And if you're just using this in a way, it's a trivial causal statement. But if you're using this, uh, then your uh, sort of confidence intervals, they decrease dramatically. And this is one of these things that, again, it's not a full story, but it's maybe a glimpse uh, of the idea that you're saying, well, the, these causal ideas can maybe help to gain statistical efficiency. I'm not saying it's a proof, but uh, I think it's a sort of a nice, uh, nice result here. And again, you can, I mean, if you don't believe in causality, you may have come up with a similar idea. I'm not saying it's necessary for this. I'm just saying this is a very natural way of looking at it. Good. Any questions about this reinforcement learning? Yeah. It's interesting feedback loop that I didn't quite see in your graphical model. Like <laughs> this your feedback, model, yeah. Right, when you know, people click on things, you use that data to learn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, totally true. Uh, this should be much reason? more complicated. Yeah, yeah we tried. I mean, the graphical model that we wrote in our paper, it's, uh, I don't know whether I have the reference, I can add it, uh, looks much more complicated. So we are including a feedback. It's a long, long-term feedback, no? Because the, the, here you also have an effect, as I said. And they're trying very hard, I think, because they don't want you to click on an ad that is, for example, promising to sell you organic apples, uh, but it's, in fact, a, a shoe store or something. Because, of course, they get money for this click, but you will be annoyed. And you will really like, use another uh, sort of search engine then. And this sort of, uh, again, uh, sort of decreases the number of, uh, may decrease the number of money that you get. So this is not only the clicks, but it's only the number of money you want to uh, sort of optimize. So this is why um, this, is the, this is a very simplified uh, picture. It, in fact, it's much, much, more, uh, much larger containing feedbacks, long-term effects. But I think it's sufficient to sort of uh, convey this idea of sort of applying this uh, causal trick here to reduce the confidence intervals. Good. So uh, I will bre very briefly sort of describe the last idea that we looked at. And this is really work in progress. Um, and then that's it for this mini course. So what's the last idea? This is the domain adaptation. and. Uh, Again, so this is uh, only an idea. 
So I welcome every one of you who is interested in this to also look at this to see whether there's something possible. So what is domain adaptation in machine learning? So uh, the names, I mean, there are millions of different versions of this. Uh, I chose this one. I'm not saying that this is everyone is using the same notation here. This is just read it as a definition. So we describe multitask learning as the following problem. So we are um, obtaining training data from different domains. So this is, let's say, the first domain. And this is uh, the dth domain. Let's say we have 10 different domains. Um, and then we are interested in sort of one test domain. And let's say in multitask learning, we are saying this is one of those. Could be all of those at the same time, but let's say it's only one. We have a very similar setup that we call transfer learning. And there the idea is to say, well, we have data from training data from different domains. Let's say different domains. And then we are interested in a test domain. And maybe this is the d plus first one. So this is really a different one. This is one where we don't have. Um, training data from. So we don't have even unlabeled data. We are, don't have any data. The question is, can we somehow exploit this data from the, um, former, data from the former domains in order to improve our performance on the test domain? Good. And here, this is uh, an assumption that I mean we are looking at. Uh, and I th this is, of course, also motivated from causality. And what does it, what does it do? Um, so there's something called the covariate shift assumption that you may have uh, uh, heard of. So what does it say? It says that, so think of this being the label, that is something that you want to predict, so whether there's a line or not. Um, and you have this now in different domains, let's say in different countries or so. This again is the picture. So the coverage shift assumption now means the following. It says that the conditional of y given x is always the same in all the domains, and the only thing that changes is sort of the, um, the distribution of the x. So this is the coverage shift assumption. And what we are saying now is, well, if you think about causality, maybe that's not the most natural assumption. Because if you have a setting where speaking about causality makes sense, then it's much more natural to assume that indeed you have a conditional that remains uh, invariant. But it should be only conditioning on the causal parents and not on everything. Because if you sort of, again, think about interventions in these different domains, um, then it's more natural to have something invariant if you condition on the parents. And this is just something that we try to exploit. So this is the assumption now. And if you like, it's really a relaxation of covariate shift because it says um, we are not assuming that it holds for sort of the full set of covariates. We're just assuming it holds for a subset. And we think about the causal, causal parents here. So we are saying that the conditional given the subset is always the same over all the domains. This is, in fact, something you can test. But then, of course, we are also assuming that this is the same in the test domain. And here in transfer learning, we cannot uh, test this, right? This is really an assumption. Setup that you have. So y given x essentially uh, means essentially you have the same noise model. Basically, so for every domain, uh, 1 to b, you basically have identical noise distributions and maybe uh, you know, identical noise variances. Yeah, if you think about an edge of noise model, for example, yeah, this would mean. I'm not claiming that this is a, uh, this is a perfect assumption, but this is something that people look at, the coverage uh, shift assumption, yeah. Do you also assume that, say, x3 given is the dependency of x3 on y is the same, or not necessarily? No, we don't assume that. Why? Yeah, this is a good point. So, um, uh, it can change, right? And now there's a trade off here. Um, so what happens if you see that in, let's say, the first domains, so if you would assume, for example, that it's, uh, you intervene on this guy, then you see a slight change in sort of how uh, y depends on x3, right? So let's assume that this holds. So we are always, we have this invariance, this holds. And the way y depends on x3, this changes slightly. And the question is now, how do you want to exploit this, right? So um, you can say that in the test domain, Maybe you are still sort of the, the way y depends on x3 is similar to one of the domains you have seen already. The other way, and this is more an adversarial way of thinking, is to say, well, if you have seen that x3 changed a bit, so the, the dependence from y on x3 changed a bit over the domains, I'm really not certain what happens in the test domain. So if you want to be conservative, you don't use x3 at all. And I'm not saying that this is, uh, this is perfect, but this is more a way of an adversarial setting. Yeah. But it's a very good point. I think uh, there should be something done here, because I think it's too conservative. What we are doing at the moment is too conservative. Yeah. OK, um, so then the question is how to transfer knowledge. And this is, I, I think, a brain teaser that I like. 
Um, so imagine the idea is now hopefully clear, right? So what we are trying to do is we are trying to find the set S. So you're trying to learn this, or maybe someone gives it to you. And then you have these coefficients here. So let's say in a linear model, you know how y depends on alpha 1 and alpha 2. And now this, is, I think, is an interesting question. So imagine that you know these coefficients. So imagine I change the picture to make it sort of the same here. So imagine we have x1, x3, and x4. They are all causes. And we know these coefficients, because this we can learn from all the domains. This is the same that over all domains, right? So this is what we can learn. So assume we're actually having so, so many data points that we can learn this alpha per perfectly. The question is now, in the test domain, of course, we have, maybe we have a graph that looks like this. The question is now, how do you use this knowledge that sort of you know exactly these coefficients if you want to build a regression model in the test domain. In the test domain, we now want to predict y from all the x's, right? And how do, make use, how do you make use of the knowledge that these coefficients you know? They are alpha 1, alpha 3, alpha 4. How do, make you, how do you make use of this? Because if you now include x5 and x6, then the optimal parameters, they will not, for x4, for example, will not be alpha 4 anymore. And the reason is that in the linear model, for example, you have these covariance structures, right? It's clear that whenever you're trying to predict y from, let's say, x4 and x6, then, of course, the covariance structure between x4 and x6 matters a lot for the coefficients, right? So, I mean, if you look at the linear regression, you're inverting the covariance uh, matrix of x. So this is a, sort of a brain teaser, this is, but this is the thing that we want to do. So we want to say, well, in all domains, we know that this condition is the same, so we learn it, and then we are applying this in the, in the last domain. And this is a problem that you have to solve. So we have an idea how to do it, but I'm not so sure whether this is optimal. So if you have a good idea how to solve this, uh, please tell me. So we, are, uh, we have an idea, but I could imagine that it's a statistically more efficient way. Okay. So here, as is written, so if you know these coefficients for some of the variables, how does it help you to find a good estimator if you now regress on like x1 to x5? It's a very simple problem, uh, and I'm not sure whether it's solved. Good. So then, what are we doing? Um, I mean, the transfer learning idea is really to say, okay, so in this new domain, what we are doing is we are using this uh, this model uh, that we have uh, that we have uh, used so far. So in the Multitask learning, we get some additional data in the test domain, so we are trying to update our alphas. In the transfer learning, we have no way because there's no new training data, and then we are just basing, uh, basing our uh, prediction on these, on these alphas that we have learned. Good. I think I skipped the rest here. So uh, you can prove that this is optimal in an adversarial setting. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is not surprising. But it also tells you that this is sort of conservative. So if you're saying, well, this remains stable, I'm pretty sure about this one was unstable in the domains that I've seen so far. So I basically, I'm now saying, well, I don't want to use it. This is a very conservative way of doing it. But this is something you can, you can try. Good. So I think with this, uh, uh, I would like to conclude. So this is, uh, um, this is what we did in the summary of uh, in this part three. So the first idea, so these were some ideas how to relate causality to, uh, um, to machine learning or statistical problems. So the first one was this idea that semi supervised learning uh, from cause to effect cannot work. This is a first order approximation, of course, of the statement. Um, here, the second idea was this half-sibling regression where we looked at the exoplanets and said uh, we are having independent measurements or measurements of independent objects from the same measurement device, and uh, we wanted to remove the systematic noise. This idea three is reformulated, maybe too strong, to just say that um, we can also sort of formulate reinforcement learning with causal in causal language, and sometimes this causal structure can actually help us in terms of statistical efficiency. For example, in a reduction of the size of confidence intervals. And this this last idea is really like something that we are exploring at the moment, where you can say that these invariant models can help you for domain adaptation or transfer learning to say that this. Uh, sort of remains invariant, and can we somehow argue that these causal structures are more likely to remain invariant? Yeah? Well, uh, ID3s are so maybe another advantage uh, of causal learning that you didn't mention. But you mentioned briefly that the suite does not matter. So uh, and right, you 
you quickly change the network, right? To say the sweet doesn't matter. The what? Sorry. The, the sweet S U I T. Ah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So, so I, I guess here it's also improved your your the search. Yes. Uh, yeah. So if you would do one w with the old, uh, you know, because then I, I guess would converge much slower. Yeah. Though, it's the same story. Yeah. So this is the. Uh, uh, indeed, the case in there, I think it's a nice example because it, it's somewhat, if you're in reinforcement learning, you would say, well, this is sort of trivial, right? So, I mean, if it, someone tells me that the suit doesn't matter, then of course I'm not using it in my strategy. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a sort of, I think in this other example that we showed, it's maybe a bit less obvious if you don't think about causality. Yeah, but I agree, it's the very similar, similar point there. About that, could, uh, I know you, you have methods to try to infer these causal networks. I mean, could you imagine a, a real case where uh, you modify the, the, uh, a less trivial case, basically, where you, where you find the simplification of the, of the causal network that you could use to optimize uh, finding a solution? So, if I understand correctly, so the question is, like, how, what other connections are there to reinforcement learning? Um, there's maybe one. Yes, so could, we, could you learn, could you benefit from learning the causal structure? So maybe, um, okay, so two, two different answers. The first one is, I think many people think that this is the case in some, there should be some connection, but if you don't have, I, I think uh, there's no breakthrough yet. But why is this that we believe this? Um, because whenever, for example, I mean, okay, deep neural networks can do a lot of things nowadays. Uh, but what you see is that um, some of them, whenever you learn how to play a computer game, for example, whenever you're changing the level, whenever you're changing something, it's not so obvious what kind of things you can transfer and one, uh, what you cannot. And this is something where we would hope that uh, causality could play a role. Because somehow, I think this is quite fascinating, I mentioned this over lunch today as well. So there, I mean, somehow, there are a couple of, if you think about games, it's not the most important application, but if you think about games, computer games, humans are extremely quick in understanding rules. So there are some games that you play and you immediately understand the rules. The question then is, how do you solve them? And somehow you understand the rules, and then often some of these games, I remember one is called, I think, Warehouse Holder, where you move boxes and you have a level and you have to move the boxes to some sort of predefined area and you should not push them against a wall in this 2D world because then you cannot uh, draw them, uh, get them back and so on. And you immediately understand the rules and then the rest is just dynamic programming. So then if you implement the rules to a computer, it's sort of solved in a second. The next level, uh, then what you have is you have exactly the same rules, it's just the more complicated level and the boxes sort of, you have more boxes, more sort of areas where they belong to and it's a bit more tricky because you can do m more mistakes and so on. But we are extremely quick in sort of inferring this rule and then transferring them to the next level. And I think this is something that current reinforcement learning techniques um, are not as good as yet as they could be. And the, the idea is that maybe causality could help there. But of course, this is very easy to say for me, this is all hand wavy. Uh, I don't think we have a good uh, sort of concrete uh, example of this yet. But this is why some people do think that uh, causality could play a role. A counter argument is the second part of the answer why, why uh, some people would say you don't need causality is if you think about not model-based reinforcement learning, but something like uh, Q-learning. What you're doing is you're sort of, you have a goal that you want to optimize and you're trying out different actions. And in a way, you don't care about the causal structure because what you're doing is you're just looking for which, which actions do I have to do in order to sort of achieve my goal. So this is what I meant at the end of the first part that I said, well, if you're interested in an IAD setting, then nothing changes, then why should you care about causality? And of course, here it's not an IAD setting, but here it's an IAD setting where nothing changes in a way. So you want to, you're trying out your actions, you're doing like you're this Q function, you're just optimizing your Q function, you just want to know which actions do I need to do in order to get the uh, best reward. And there, so these are the two sides of the same uh, sort of story, no? So you can say, in a way, you don't care about causality, about this all what happens in between, because you're just interested in the reward and what do I have to do? But, this is the first part of the answer, if things change, so if you want to transfer knowledge, maybe then indeed you are interested in the causal structure. Sure whether, I'm not sure whether this is a satisfying answer, but uh, I do think that, uh, it, it, I'm, I mean, I'm not betting on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is some uh, development in this area. Yeah. Good, any other questions about this part three? Uh, good, so with this I think I would uh, like to end this mini course. 
Uh, I would also like uh, to thank one more Philippe uh, for the very kind invitation. It was a pleasure for me to be here. This is uh, some uh, references that if you are interested, you may have a look at. These are uh, sort of a couple of books. There are many more, of course. So this, the first one is the most famous one. It's the book by Judea Pearl, who's certainly one of the big figures uh, in this field. And it's a, I mean, it's a super fascinating book. Uh, there's uh, there is an enormous amount of uh, interesting thoughts and ideas in there. Um, I enjoyed it a lot uh, reading, but this is uh, also a lot of advanced stuff. So it's very hard to read, I think, as a first book. This is the book from the CMU people, Peter Spertus, Clark Lima, Richard Shines, which focuses a bit more on the, like these independence-based uh, learning techniques, for example, called causation prediction and search. Also a, a nice book. We also, as I mentioned earlier, we have now finished a book that is already online available, so that's going to appear at MIT Press as open access. This is an early version of this, so I just receive, I'm just receiving the uh, copy editing uh, version, so there will be a lot of changes <laughs> to the text, I think, <laughs> uh, but you can already have a look at this, and of course we are more than happy to uh, receive feedback on this. We try to uh, sort of introduce to the topic a bit more from the machine learning statistics point of view. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to thank you a lot for your attention for these eight hours almost. Thanks. So just to conclude, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Jonas for agreeing to do this, actually. Uh, he's doing it completely uh, uh, out of goodwill. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to seeing uh, uh, the book out. Please feel free to send an email every day to MIT Press so they feel under pressure. Uh, <laughs> The other thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, as you've seen, those uh, videos have been recorded and they will be made available uh, maybe in several places, but one is for sure is the um, models, uh, inference, and algorithms uh, playlist uh, at the Broad Institute. So uh, you just Google uh, models, uh, inference, and algorithms, and uh, you will land on your page. And uh, there's a link to the YouTube playlist where you can find them. And I think we have an agreement uh, with Jonas that he will make the slides available. Uh, I don't know where they're going to be available, but there will definitely be a link from the MIA, uh, from the MIA uh, webpage so you can find them there. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you for coming. Thank you.